of uh, the third Guardians of the Galaxy film this past week. Uh, it was a long movie, like two and a half hours. But we still, and we still had to get up for our 6.30 a.m. morning prayer together, but it was worth it because uh, it was a good flick, a fun flick. Uh, Father Brian and I like to keep up somewhat with that part of the, the Marvel Universe. But that movie, and a number of recent ones like Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, etc., these movies have been uh, obsessed with parallel and alternative universes, right? Even our, and even our pop culture obsession with these characters with superpowers, it points us to this sense that we're made for something more than we currently experience, right? And that obsession has made me think about how as much as the world tries to, de to deny the existence of God and of Christianity in particular, the human intuition of a transcendent realm, that innate sixth sense that we have of a realm beyond what is visible to us in our material universe cannot be suppressed. Right? If you try to suppress the truth of it, that proclivity for the supernatural will still come out in divergent and eclectic ways. Even all, our, all the sci-fi movies and fantasy movies like Star Wars or Harry Potter or The Lord of the Rings, they all touch upon this inherent instinct of a reality or a spiritual realm that is beyond our own. And here's the thing. It's our faith that gets us in touch with the real thing. It's in our living relationship with God that we actually get to participate in the real supernatural realm. Take the Nicene Creed that we return to professing each Sunday, right, after uh, we've been doing the Apostles' Creed in Easter. We state that we believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, right? That's the spiritual realm beyond our limited material senses. But, or, or by the way, one more film suggestion. Father Brian and I recommend you go watch another movie. It's no longer in the theaters, but just started streaming this weekend called Nefarious. It's not a horror movie like a lot of people thought, like a lot of movies that are about the demon possession, but it's not also a movie that you want to bring your kids to. Uh, but for those who are fans of C.S. Lewis, the screw tape letters, I think you'll love Nefarious because it reveals the cunning ways the devil to this day entraps humanity as the ruler of this world. Uh, but it's starting, it started streaming this weekend. Anyway, as much as the world poo-poos the existence of a spiritual realm, we sure obsess about it in the expression of our popular culture, don't we? And so that obviously relates to today's big solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, because God is pure spirit. This one God who, cannot, who we cannot see is the foundation of all reality, spiritual and material. In him we live and move and have our being. Without him, all things cease to exist, right? We're being upheld right now by that fundamental, uh, he who is the act of existence itself. But this one God has revealed himself to us and does so in a peculiar way as a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if I asked you what you think is the central mystery of our entire Catholic faith, what would you say? Which one would you pick? You might say, you know, since the Easter Triduum is the highest liturgical season of the year, and then we celebrate Easter with eight straight days of solemnity from Easter Sunday to Divine Mercy Sunday, you may say, of course, it's the Paschal Mystery of Easter. You might, some people might be, might choose Christmas because if the incarnation and Jesus was never born in, into our world, if that never happened, his rescue mission wouldn't have, wouldn't have been possible or never accomplished. But notice these are all events of salvation history. Right, we celebrate them as central to what God has done. Their actions, their God's actions, saving actions for sure. But the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is not about what God has done, but about who God is. Today's solemnity is not about God's actions, it's about his very essence, the very nature of who he is. 
Even the catechism points this out, right? Look it up in paragraph 234. It states this, should be 123, but it's 234. The mystery of the most holy trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of faith, that enlight the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of faith. End of quote. So that's what we're celebrating this very Sunday. Right? The central mystery from which all the other mysteries flow. Just like, you know, us as human persons. What's more central to us is who we are. Even above what we do because the prim of the primacy of being over doing. Right? What we do flows from who we are. Our actions flow from our nature or character that, uh, that is who we are. And who is God? What's the good four-letter word that God is? It starts with an L. God is love. That radical Christian claim. There is no other system of belief, philosophy, or religion that professes that God is not just loving. Everybody, all, practically all the religions believe that God is loving. But it's the only one that professes that God is love itself. It's not just one of his many attributes. Again, this is all in the Catechism, paragraph 221. It says this, but St. John goes even further when he affirms that God is love. God's very being is love, the Catechism states. By sending his only Son and the Spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. Usually ears perk up when we talk about secrets, right? Are you ready to hear what God's innermost secret is? Drum roll, please. All right. God has revealed his innermost secret, that God himself is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he has destined us to share in that exchange. You know, you usually just reveal your innermost secrets to the closest people of, that you love. And God has done that for humanity. And he's revealed himself as this eternal exchange of love. And friends, your destiny and my mind for all eternity, should we choose to accept God's invitation by living his commandments of love here and now, is to share in that eternal exchange of love that is God. We were made for that destiny, and we will be miserable for all eternity, eternity if we do not attain it. So repeat after me. God is an eternal exchange of love. Eternal exchange of love. Hold on to that, because we're going to build on it, right? So that innermost secret of who God is, is the absolute key to understanding why God is necessarily a trinity of persons. Every Christian should be able to explain the central mystery of what they believe. And so as a pastor, I want you to be able to explain what the trinity is as that eternal exchange of love who is God. Love is, not, it, love is what God is, right? It's not simply what, that God loves as one of his many actions or functions or that God has love or that that's what God does. No, love is who God is. And you can't be love itself and only be one person. Love is inherently relational. And so as I've said before, if you're only one person and you're, that's, you can't be love. That's not love, that's narcissism. We got enough of that, right? And so we go from the truth that God is love itself that you can't just be one person. And this is where we go to the truth that God and love itself, love entails a relationship of persons. This is what we mean by the fact that God is a communio personarum, a, a relationship of persons. Because you, wherever love is, you necessarily have to have three realities. What are they? The lover, number one. The beloved, number two. Those are the two obvious ones. But what's the third reality? It's the love that they share together, right? 
And so in God, in his oneness, God is a relationship of persons. You have the father giving himself complete and complete love to the son here. You can see his, the very, his very breath, the ruah of God, the Holy Spirit, breathing upon his son, giving himself in total love to the son. And the son then offers himself back in total love to the father. And the, the shared love that is between father and son, well, you see, you see that dove? That's what the Holy Spirit uh, that dove represents the Holy Spirit. So those three realities, number one, lover, God the Father. Number two, his beloved son. And number three, their shared love that is the Holy Spirit. And so because love is fruitful, creation itself is sometimes described as this, oh, the overflow of, love, of God's goodness. An overflow of this copious eternal exchange of love that is the Trinity. And because humanity in particular is made in the image and likeness of God, you and I are made to love as God loves. And since we're made by love and created to love, we're necessarily given freedom, the free will to choose love. That capacity, however, obviously entails the capacity not to choose love. And that's when the human family got into trouble, right? And not only the human family, but all other spiritual persons. Humans are not the only people. For example, what do we call the three parts of the Godhead? The three persons of the Trinity. And after God himself, what do we call those that God has created who are pure spirit, but like us have a, like us have a rational intellect and will, but are pure spirits? What are they called? Angels. Exactly. And so anyway, the human family abused our freedom and chose sin instead of love, and that's when we, be we began being inhuman to each other, inhumane. But God did not abandon us. He didn't say, oh, forget you. That's where today's gospel comes in, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. God is the principle of all existence. And so when we believe in him and we cleave to him, and as the greatest commandment uh, tells us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, not just for all eternity, but here and now, we will be saved. And we will reach the destiny for which we were made, that eternal exchange of love that is the triune God. Jesus has already reserved a spot for us. If you recall from a couple weeks ago, by his ascension into heaven, when he brought with him back into the life of the Trinity something that he did not have before, which is our humanity. And until the consummation of history, God gives us a pledge of his divinity, as Father Brian explained last Sunday, at Pentecost, by imparting upon us his own supernatural life through the Holy Spirit. These are the superpowers we're meant to have in this world. Right? The life of the Spirit. So let us in these coming days respond to the love God has extended to us by loving him in return. And there are two opportunities in particular I'd like to highlight. The first is next Sunday, which is Corpus Christi Sunday, the solemnity of the most holy body and blood of, of Christ. Next Sunday marks the beginning of our parish's participation in the Eucharistic revival that has been going on in our diocese and throughout the country this past year. So if you've never participated in our regional Corpus Christi procession over at our St. Joseph campus, please plan on participating at the three at three o'clock next Sunday afternoon there at Waterloo. One of the, there's four different altars that we stop at. One altar is uh, made by Queens. Another altar is made by uh, the Sagra Sagrada Corazon community, the Hispanic Catholic community, and then one, uh, two others by St. Joseph and St. John, right? So this year's First Communicants are invited to wear their First Communion outfits to that. The second concrete opportunity to respond in faith to the love that the Holy Trinity pours out upon us is the Thursday evening after Corpus Christi on June 15th, which is the eve of the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we'll be enthroning the Sacred Heart of Jesus here in our parish with a special 6 p.m. Mass of the Sacred Heart uh, on the eve of the Sacred Heart. And it's followed by uh, a parish enthronement ceremony. So 
Um, everybody will get one of these. And the way you get one of these is as you walk out of church today, there will be two tables, one at this entrance and one at that entrance. You simply put your name and your email and we'll have one of these packets made up for you. They will all appear at that mass on Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Um, and uh, should you, f for some reason, not be able to make that mass, we'll hold on to you f uh, for it, the, and it'll be at the parish office. But the ideal, obviously, is to pick it up during the mass of enthronement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then you take this image and you uh, enthrone the Sacred Heart of Jesus in your home uh, by placing this at your home. You know, it was... Uh, as you know, the, the month of June is the month to honor uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That's the pride we should have, right, in the month of June. And when Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary in 1675, he gave 12 promises to those who would venerate the Sacred Heart. And his ninth promise to her, he said that he would bless the homes in which the image of his Sacred Heart would be exposed and honored, right? And... Uh, that that, that um, devotion has kind of, uh, you know, decreased over the last, over, over the decades. And we want to revive it again because our homes have been taken over in many ways by, uh, talk about spiritual realities, some of the more demonic tendencies in our world today, right? Through, you know, creeping into our homes through media, through uh, institutions that have, um, anti-Christian uh, agendas, whatever it may be. We want to reclaim our homes uh, through the Sacred Heart of Jesus, enthroning the Sacred Heart of Jesus here in our parish and in our homes. So that is uh, coming up on the Thursday after Corpus Christi. This is the way the Catechism explained it, the Sacred Heart. This is four, uh, paragraph 478. Jesus has loved us all with a human heart. For this reason... The sacred heart of Jesus, pierced by our sins and for our salvation, is quite rightly the chief sign, uh, the chief sign and, sorry, the chief sign and symbol of that love with which the divine Redeemer continually loves the eternal Father and all human beings without exception. God loves everyone without exception. The question is, will we love him in return? 